Reverend Melanie, it's good to be with you again. <laughs> thank you. It's good to be here. And thank you again so much for the books. You're quite welcome. We will treasure them. Thank you. In this uh, second part of the discussion, I want us to mainly focus on these uh, two books. One is uh, Making Sense of the Bible by Adam Hamilton. Uh, would be the first part of our discussion. And the second part, Zealot, uh, Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslan. So let's focus on this, uh, on this book first, which he, he is a Unitarian, uh, I mean, uh, Methodist minister. And um, it, it takes a lot of courage on his part to be able to write something like this and explain uh, to people of our age that they should not be taking uh, the Bible seriously, uh, literally in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of parables, a lot of stories, a lot of things were written by people of uh, 3,000 years ago. And most importantly, Old Testament was not composed by Moses, or the New Testament was not composed by Jesus, but rather, mm -hmm. Old Testament was composed in the course of, some people say, 800 years, or according to him and, uh, and the other book, in the course of 1400 years by hundreds of individuals. It's, so, who were supposedly inspired by the word of Moses? Same thing in the case of Jesus and, and the New Testament that was not composed by him, that Jesus could not even read or write, mm -hmm. uh, that his uh, language was Aramaic, and the first Bible was in Greek, and it was composed some 50 or 70 years after crucifixion. Uh, so all of these points are brought up, and then, uh, and, and then uh, the other point uh, that one of these two authors have, has emphasized is the fact that uh, that the first writings of the Bible was mainly by one apostle, the only one who could read or write, mm -hmm. who was Paul. Uh, and he was the only apostle who had never seen Jesus, the only one. Yes. Everybody else had seen Jesus, knew Jesus, and after crucifixion, actually the, the church, which means that all these apostles, had huge problem with Paul because they said, where are you making these up from? What are you saying? The Jews that we know did not say this. A lot of these things. So a lot of these things are uh, discussed in one way or another in the first book or the second one. So if you want, if you wish, if you could read the first paragraph Hamilton, that's the questions that we got to this book, and then let's discuss it. Okay, I have read it, yes. But if, if you read it again for, for the audience. Oh, read it out loud? Okay, yes. Hamilton indicates that the Bible, which was composed in the course of 1400 years by hundreds of individuals, includes many contradictions, many violent passages, harsh treatment for some infractions of rules, as well as passages which allude to the acceptance of slavery and lower status for women, etc and includes passages regarding creation, life of the planet, how the world came to existence and humans were created, which are not in line with true science and or are not suitable for this day and age, or were simply parables and stories which were not to be taken literally. Thus, reconsidering such passages in lieu of the current needs of our time is needed. And what is our take on this? So that's basically the question. So um, these people were convinced, I'm convinced, the Baha'i faith that Baha'u'llah is convinced mm -hmm. uh, that the spirit of the Bible is the truth, but not every word in it. Uh, and, and taking it literally leads to prejudice and superstitions and unfounded dogmas and a lot of problems that we see in the world today. So what yes. Do you think? No, I think that is true, and we've, we've certainly explored those notions here at One World and in previous conversations with you. Um, the Bible was written. By, as this says, by many individuals over hundreds of years, um, all of whom came from a cultural context, and all of whom may have been inspired by their own personal relationship of what they believed the story of Jesus to be, or the story of the Old Testament to be, but the fact that they were writing from a very 
individual and discrete cultural place right. means that what they wrote may not pertain to us. Right. Um, for example, um, selling your children into slavery or killing your children for disobedience or not wearing clothing made of two different types of fiber woven together. You and I would both be in serious trouble. Right. So there are many prohibitions in the Bible which may have made sense then but do not make sense now, but it doesn't deny that the overall spirit of the scripture is a very powerful thing. And indeed, that's one thing that Hamilton writes here, the front of his book, making sense of the Bible, rediscovering the power of scripture today. If you read scripture in a way that speaks to you kind of metaphysically, where you get the deeper meaning of it without getting hung up on the literalism of it, for many, including me, it becomes much more powerful Right. Because it speaks to me on a place where I live. Right. Right. So I agree with you. I think this is entirely true. We do need to look at it in the context of what it says to us today. Right. And then not, not taking some of those stories literally, because mm -hmm. that's where the problem starts. You know, one sincere Christian woman came to my door one day, and, and she, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the preachers get a little angry at times, and with God or with people. And, 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 uh, and he was saying uh, that because of all the sins that we have committed, mm -hmm. that's why our life is shortened to 80 or 90 years. Because we used to live 800 or 900 years. I said, how did that come about? And she opened the Bible and there's something right. in the Bible that such and such lived to be 800, 850 years. And so I said, you know, but this uh, proven science does not accept it. I says, no, they are wrong. This is the word of God, and that's what it is. And that's where prejudice starts, you know, superstitions, uh, which that, that we have to consider the fact that these were parables, stories, or they had deeper meanings. Well, even times. Jesus said they were parables. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he says, he, he talked about parables, and he, he said to his disciples, that he spoke in parables to those who could not hear. Right. But to them, he just spoke plainly because they could hear. Right. So it's a question of consciousness. It's a question of the ability to look at the scripture and see it in a way that speaks to you, that takes the right. essence of it, the essence love it. and the compassion and what Jesus was telling us. So I think you're entirely right. I agree with this paragraph. Wonderful. Well, uh, the second part deals with the second book, uh, Zealot. The Life and Times of Jesus Nazareth. There, there, are, there were several interviews on Fox News and, and CNN. Oh, I remember, uh, yeah. And, and other places, and some of them not too kindly. Uh, now, he's a professor of religion, a, a theologian, has studied the scriptures deeply, has written about Buddha and Muhammad and, and Jesus, and, and mainly from a historical perspective. So, reading his book was really an eye opener for me because. A lot of things that I'd accepted based on Baha'u'llah's writings, from a, mainly from the general theological perspective, he proves it basically based on history. And what he was saying is that uh, one thing that Romans were, were good about was keeping records. Yes, that is true. <laughs> and yes, everything was, true. was recorded. So if you would again, if you read this second paragraph uh, from this book by Reza Aslan, and then we can chat about it. Yes. Reza Aslan takes a historical view of the life of Jesus based on all the evidence that he could find and concludes that A, there are several inconsistencies in the letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, plus several accounts were simply put aside and not included in the Bible, which was composed some 40 to 70 years after the crucifixion, and the final version of which was produced after the Conference of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era and another conference 70 years later, B, Jesus had several brothers and sisters, James, etc. But after such discovery, the church taught that they were children of Joseph, and thus half-brothers or sisters. C, the Roman edict for condemnation of Jesus by the Romans was essentially on the charges of treason and disturbing the peace, and no mention of magic and bringing back the dead to life, etc., which carried the death penalty as well, and several contemporaries of Jesus were condemned to death on such charges. D, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man and not the Son of God or God, as coined later by some of the apostles. 
E, usually crucifixion was performed in public and the body left on the cross for the birds of prey to consume. There is no formal evidence of Jesus' burial and rising after three days and coming back to earth. F, salvation through belief alone or faith together with deeds. G, is faith believing in unbelievables without evidence? Or should it be based on conscious knowledge together with deeds? Well, that's a lot to think about. That's a about. lot to think about. Yes. But well, a couple of points, uh, I'll give you the Baha'i perspective. Baha'i perspective, on issues such as uh, crucifixion, crucifixion and rising and then coming back to life after three days and things of that nature, uh, Baha'is take it from only from the spiritual perspective, right. not literal. Uh, that of course, uh, Jesus did not leave us. You know, when, when he was crucified, uh, his whole mission was to lead us forward for thousands of years afterwards. And of course, he was with us not only after three days, he, he was with us for over a thousand years to lead us forward to, to a higher civilization. So in that respect, that is the, that is the way Baha'u'llah views it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is mainly spiritual, not literal. And, uh, and then uh, on another issue on the question of that we are all sinners and, and, and things like that, that some churches emphasize, Baha'u'llah on the other hand emphasizes that Jesus had also said that we're all made in the image of God. Uh, so in that sense, uh, his take is that we are all made noble. God had made us noble. And that, of course, we're not perfect. Uh, but that, the same way that when we talk to our children, if you put them down and say, you're bad, you're bad, they get worse. Right. But if we tell them that they're good, they're essentially good, and therefore they'll elevate, they'll become better. So that is, that's us. The other point, again from the Baha'i perspective, is that faith, according to Baha'u'llah, is conscious knowledge, which means that you just don't believe in unbelievers because somebody told you, or somebody shouts and says, that's the way God tells you, therefore believe in it. But he says, think about it. Use your reason. Does it make sense? Does it agree with proven science? Mm -hmm. And then that is, is the kind of faith that would, would sit with you and you can live with it and you can enjoy it. Otherwise, it's always fear. It's always uh, some, it causes some additional problems. And that is the kind of thing that particularly Ken Armstrong mm -hmm. uh, emphasizes, that because of the way sin and sinners and unbelievables were indoctrinated in the human mind, uh, by 18th century, a lot of people were becoming psychotic. I mean, fearful, sure. fearful, and, and therefore, they developed psychological problems as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was 19th century when they said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. And that is when the book, uh, the, the God is Dead, was written. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the last chapter of the history of God. And by 19th century, just like when we said some of the congregants come and say that, you know, we don't want to hear about these kind of things anymore. Right. We want to hear something positive, something nurturing, something elevating our soul. So these are the kind of issues that Aslan also talks about. So your take on all of that. I think that's one thing I think we all notice in houses of worship or meeting places all over the country is people want to hear something positive. Even uh, preachers who are in more traditional churches, when they build their congregations and people come, they do it on a message of positivity, yeah. of hope, of abundance, of prosperity, of better days to come. People are not attracted by messages that they are sinners, right. that they are doing something wrong, that they better fix it or something really bad is gonna happen. Right. But addressing what Reza Aslan says, I'm interested in his first point where he talks about the inconsistencies in the different books of the Bible. Uh, we were talking about that last week here at One World. If you look at the timeline of when the Bible was written, you're exactly right. St. Paul wrote 20 to 34 years after the crucifixion and his version of the, of the story of Jesus' death has no story of Jesus physically rising from the dead. It's not even in there. Paul's notion, and we got this from reading uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong, who is a former Episcopal bishop and a, a very um, creative thinker in the traditional Christian church. Um, 
he tries to take it a step kind of beyond the traditional church, and he tries to give a new look to the scriptures and a new look at Christianity in general. But what he talked about in an article he wrote in 2003 called The Resurrection is he pointed out that Paul wrote first, as you said, and he contained no story of Jesus physically rising from the dead. For Paul, his version of the resurrection was Jesus rising, as you said, from human into God. Jesus rose from his human self to his divine self. He didn't rise from human to human again. That really would be rising from the dead, but it wouldn't really be an advancement. According to St. Paul, Jesus rose to become God, which is what is possible for all of us as we rise into our own divinity, a consciousness of divinity. We then have the, the apostles, the, the gospels, which were written, starting with, I believe, Mark, and ending up with John. John wrote about 95 to 100 years after the crucifixion. Yes, the last one. The last one. And what happened in those years is the story got more and more embellished. And finally, with John, we have Jesus rising back up into his human form. He eats, he walks around, he is touched. He is just Jesus again, physically here. He eats fish. Thomas notices the wounds in his side and touches him. That is an embellishment of the original story. And the apostles were trying to say something. What were they trying to say? For them, something so incredibly powerful had happened that that was the only way they could think to express that power. Exactly. Jesus risen physically. Right. But That's the way people of that time could better that's exactly to it. understand. Yes, they were trying to communicate the, ultra, the, the ultimate wonder of what had happened. Right. And that would have been the most amazing thing. Right. What is interesting to me is if you look at the last 100 years or so, you really see a wealth of biblical scholarship with uh, archaeological discoveries. You see the Dead Sea Scrolls. You see the Nag Hammadi find in 1945, which gave us the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, okay. the Gospel of Mary. There has been so much biblical scholarship in the last decades that it opens up for us kind of a new understanding of what the scripture might have meant that was not available at the Council of Nicaea or 70 years later. In the Council of Nicaea, when they decided what the canon of the Bible was going to be, there were certain books that were put aside. Well, if we were to do the same thing again, I don't know what would be included. Mm -hmm. So there is so much scripture out there that is rich and that is meaningful that is not included within the traditional Bible. I mean, there are some Bibles which include the Apocrypha. Some don't. So there's a lot of diversity, even in what people will regard as Holy Scripture. But there are also inconsistencies. And again, those inconsistencies, I think, are bounded, as you say, by the culture of the times. Right. And who wrote it? Exactly. And when it was written. Yeah, exactly. And who wrote it? Right. Jesus never did refer to himself as the Son of God. Actually, what Jesus said is that we can do what he does and better. Hmm. I mean, Jesus' message was, I am stepping aside so that you can continue to carry on this work. He was the example yeah. for, for the yeah. rest of us. He, was, he, he even got mad when people would look at him and make him the message instead of the messenger. He was saying, no, I am just showing you what you can do yourselves. If you tap into the God that was within you, he didn't say that, but I believe that's what he was saying. He was saying, we are all like this. We can all do right. these things. It's interesting that in one of these... Uh, writings, uh, I guess in the Zealot, uh, he talks about the fact that none of these messengers came and said that I brought a new religion. No. They all came to restate the same message. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus never said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, Jesus was always was a, Jew. a Jew. Yeah, and he, I don't think he ever wanted to be anything but a Jew. He said, this is just the way that you too can be in better communion with God. This is how you can live a life a godlike life, and he just showed us how to do it. But and in fact, he also showed us that it's time for renewal of religion. Yeah. He also, which is interesting, and this is something you said earlier, is it's interesting that he was a humble man. He showed, he was a carpenter. He was not. He didn't come back. He wasn't um, a Pharisee. He didn't have money. He didn't have position. What he was saying is, is that the kingdom of God is available to everyone to sinners, to the despised, to the sick, to the imprisoned. I mean, that's the message that he gave, coming back as the humble person he was. Exactly. And the main message that sticks with me from Jesus 
the blessed are the poor and the meek. Yes. Yeah. That's the main message. Yeah. The most that, beautiful that, message. It is. It remains the message. It remains the message. Right. Yeah. It absolutely does. And it's a message that is echoed in other faith traditions, not just yes. Christianity. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, but it seems to me as I read different scriptures that there is sometimes there's more emphasis uh, for one aspect, one particular aspect, which was the problem at the time. There were there were a few very rich uh, Jewish family and many wealthy uh, Romans, mm -hmm. but the masses were poor. The masses were ignorant. The masses were looked down upon, uh, including Jesus and Nazareth mm -hmm. in particular. You know. Yeah. Uh, and so, and he came to revive us, to tell us the real meaning of being a human. Well, and he told us. I think part of the reason that he talked about blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, is because it is possible to, to, to focus so much on riches, to focus so much on what we have, to focus so much on our stuff. And, you know, that gets in our way. Yeah. I mean, it is a diversion. Okay. There, there, I mean, obviously we need certain levels of support in order to live. Yeah. But beyond that... It is excess. Yeah, beyond that's... You know, what does it say, where, where, the, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also? Your treasure has to be with God. Right. Because if your treasure is in something else, that means that's where your heart is. And that was the message of the disciples too, who gave everything they had. You know, the, the, the household, the belongings, everything. And they, when they followed Jesus, they were following him in the path of humility, in the path of service, yeah. in the path of supporting the poor. And somehow that message needs to come back. Well, Which is the essence of all of these faiths. Yeah. I mean, one thing Jesus said is, he said, when you travel, he said, take nothing for the journey, mm -hmm. which means just go. And that means when you go, not only are you divested of concerns with wealth and with possessions, but you also trust in God's abundance to provide for you on the way. Mm -hmm. You take nothing. You take a pair of sandals and you go. And you know that as you go, you will be provided for. That's a huge step of faith. And that's demonstrating your belief in God's just showering light on your life. Yes. Any other thoughts with regard to some of the other things he has said? Oh my just goodness. If you look, look at it and just see what I know, comes to mind. This is so rich. I'm looking at the part is faith believing in unbelievables without evidence. And I like what you said about faith including belief in in science right. and not just a belief in unbelievables. If I have faith as a belief in unbelievables, it means that I am believing because somebody told me to. Yes, somebody forced it to my head. Yes, that's not a question of belief, that's just acceptance. Belief right. is a visceral thing. Right. Belief is a, is a conscious thing. And if I believe something, it's because I know it to be true from my own experience. Right. As Joseph Campbell said, I don't, I don't need belief, I have experience. Yes. I'm paraphrasing, but I believe yes. he said something like that. Yeah. And so, if I'm going to believe something, it's something that I have to know is true for me. Yeah. And I can inform myself through reading science, through talking to other people, through sitting and thinking and meditating about it. But I cannot believe because somebody in a position of authority says you need to believe. I may shut up and not say anything, but it doesn't, believe, it doesn't mean that I believe it. One other point I'd like to point out and see what, what you think uh, from what Reza Asana said is that um, during the time of Jesus, uh, any person who pretended or, or, or made tricks so that somebody who is dead you know, rises and things like that, uh, that they would immediately be executed by the Romans. <laughs> I mean, the, the charge was clear. As he, said, he says, based on the records, he sees this guy and that guy and that guy were, were, were executed because they claim that they can rise people from the dead. But then he says that, interestingly enough, there is none of that kind of charge in, uh, in, for, for crucifixion of Jesus. Yes. And, and he says, and again, the Baha'i belief is that, uh, is that, of course he raised millions of people from death, but this, is, this was the spiritual death. These are people who had lost their race, who did not know what priorities of life was, mm -hmm. but it was through the message of Jesus that they really rose. Mm -hmm. from, that, from that death of spirit. So this is our take, and that is Aslan's take that there's no historical evidence. 
And I want to see what you think of that. Well, that's very interesting because those are, I mean, if you read the scripture literally, I mean, he raised several people from the dead. He raised Lazarus, he raised the woman's young, he raised the woman's only son, uh, he raised the daughter of the soldier. So if there's no historical proof of that, um, you have to bring those accounts into question. Right. But the greater question is, are those stories, is it necessary for them to be true for us to be followers of Jesus? Whatever our faith, and the answer is no. No, because living a life inspired by his life yes. connects yeah. us more with our own awareness of God and our own purpose for being on earth. I mean, you do not have to be a Christian only if you believe that Jesus literally raised from the dead, right. any more than if you only believe that the Red Sea parted or the sun froze in the sky over Jericho. There are so many messages there which read in a, a greater spiritual con context means so much to us. And that's one thing that um, Bishop Spong pointed out in his article. He said, in order to take a fresh look at the Easter story, because we're in the season of Easter, right. is it necessary to believe that Jesus rose physically? And his answer was no, which is a very radical thought. Yes. But and again, for people of 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, maybe these stories and these parables and this sort of thinking was necessary mm -hmm. in order to give them more meaning, a deeper meaning of things. Yeah. But today, uh, you know, with this advancement of science and our intellect, uh, we don't need to believe in unbelievables, maybe. No, and it's also questions of translation. Uh, one of the things we had here at One World on Friday was Reverend Sidney McGill Lindquist did a Good Friday communion service. And one of the things she talked about was the original meaning of communion. And she, she discussed that the phrase, um, eating my body and drinking my blood, has been misunderstood. There's a belief in the traditional, in many traditional churches, in transubstantiation which means that when you eat the wafer, you are literally eating the body of Christ, and when you drink the wine, you are literally drinking his blood. But she went back to the original Aramaic translation, and apparently the idiom in translation, when Jesus said, I have eaten my body and drunk my blood, he didn't mean to do it literally. Literal, what he said was, I have just worn myself into a frazzle. I have worked so hard, I am exhausted, and now it is up to you to continue the work. Mm -hmm. But those words, eating my body, drinking my blood, were taken literally, again, what we're talking about. So people say, well, that's what we have to do. But that's not what Jesus was saying under that translation. Yeah. He was saying, it's a, it was an idiom. Mm -hmm. And in Middle Eastern languages, well, you know, in Farsi, there are a great many idioms. In right. Persian, it's full of beautiful idioms. Right. And the same is true for other, for other languages. Right. It was an idiom for, I have worn myself into a complete nubbin. And you folks need to take it on. I'm just exhausted. Yes, yes. Uh, let me, let's focus on one more thought on, the, on this part. And, and that is that uh, I'd like to know what your take is on, on, on the question of Trinity. If you could say a few words. Um, again, from the Baha'i perspective, uh, God is the unknowable essence and he's indivisible. indivisible. Uh, that what we call prophets or manifestations of God, including Jesus and Buddha and Baha'u'llah and Muhammad, they're basically intermediaries between God and man. They're not one and the same. Also, Baha'u'llah explains that when they're conveying the message of God, then therefore the self is put aside, even if they say, I'm God, it's fine. But this is when they're conveying the message of God. But then Jesus, Baha'u'llah, all the others, they were human beings. They were perfect human beings mm -hmm. who were giving a message to share. And therefore, uh, you know, Bahá'u'lláh took exception with this idea of God incarnate. Because he says God is the unknowable essence, and these are the perfect mirrors. Just like the sun and the image of the God in the mirror, and they were those mirrors. Right. So I want to see what your take is on this. Well, the Trinity is a subject that I have struggled with. In, I mean, I grew up as an Episcopalian. Yeah. And as I was growing up, I really did not understand that the concept of the Trinity did not resonate with me. Um, in my own way of thinking now, if I consider the concept of a Trinity, to me, it indicates a separation of me from God, because you have Father, Son, and Holy. You have three things. So one might argue that they are three separate things. 
And that, to me, indicates a separation and a duality which is not there. If I'm going to consider ways to think about the Trinity in a helpful way, I can think of it of the Father being God, the power that is us right. all, the Son being us, our individual manifestations of God um, on earth, as not separate from God, but just kind of a different way of looking at the same concept. Reflections of that yeah, spirit. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, kind of in the Hindu tradition, we have one God, but many, manif many different right. manifestations yeah, right. of God. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit that animates each of us to remain in contact with God, to know God, to live our divine essence out. The concept of Trinity is not helpful to me right. in my own spiritual journey, and it's something I actually am still working on. It's not necessary for me, but I'm still I'm still struggling with it. Well, that is a question that many philosophers have struggled yes. with, and actually. Uh, based on my reading of particularly Ken Armstrong, History of God, uh, she says that uh, from 17th century to 19th century, one of the major philosophical struggle of, of Christian thinkers mm -hmm. was on the divisive nature of this idea of, of Trinity. Right. And, uh, and, and therefore, they were talking about the same thing, that you know, the God is the source. Mm -hmm. And, and then the mirror and, and the reflections. And so that caused a lot of scribbling and, and thinking uh, and, and a lot of separation. A lot of people who went away from the church yeah. went away because of that, not understanding the, the, that concept, basically. Yeah, it just didn't make sense. I mean, I, I stayed in the church until I was a young teenager, and then I was away for a number of years. And I just have not ever understood the traditional notion of the Trinity. I still think about it. I still would love to talk more about it. But to me, it just does not, it just does not resonate. It's not part of my notion of, of God or my relationship with God. Thank you so much for the last segment. I just want to see if you have any other thought. I just, this has been such a wonderful experience. I so appreciate it. Thank I mean, so what a thorough discussion. I really enjoy it. We have to do it again. Thank you so much. We should. We'll, we'll read some more. Yes. We'll get together again. Thank you All so right. much. All right. Thank you, Raj. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.